All right. So, thanks very much for joining uh, me and David. I'm Alex Hasselkos. For those of you that don't know me, David Lund, he introduced himself as well. But um, just a little bit about our backgrounds first. So I'm a functional range conditioning um, or FRC mobility specialist. David's going to explain a little bit about what is in, in a moment. Um, I'm also a kin stretch uh, instructor. So kin, you can think of kin stretch as like a group mobility or group body awareness and control class that's based on the principles of FRC. Um, I'm also a 500 hour plus uh, certified yoga instructor. I've been teaching yoga for six or seven years now. And um, David and I are both working towards uh, further certifications in the functional range systems, functional range assessment with training, which we'll be doing in a couple weeks. Um, but that just really helps us to work more specifically with, uh, with individual clients to assess their to assess their, their joint capacity and movement capabilities and work with them individually on their body specific goals. So that's my intro. Thanks. On to David. Yep. Um, so my name is David Lund. If you haven't met me before, um, I think we have like some people who follow me who are on here who don't know Alex and then people who follow Alex who maybe don't know me. Uh, I'm mostly a CrossFit athlete and CrossFit coach, uh, but within that, I teach uh, weightlifting, gymnastics, and also mobility because mobility is so important for all these movements that we try to do in CrossFit. Um, I'm also FRCMS, uh, Functional Range Conditioning. So Functional Range Conditioning is basically a system of training your joints to improve your mobility. Um, and then Alex is also kin stretch certified. So do you want to have you talk? About yeah, that? I just I mentioned what kin stretch okay. is. Yeah, it's like a group mobility a class, uh, kind of like a mobility, or I often like to call it a body awareness and control class that's taught in a group setting. And at the end of our little discussion here, I will, or both of us will lead parts of it through a kin stretch like class or a mobility class. Yeah, so kin stretch is basically kind of like the class version of FRC. So it's just taking FRC stuff, applying it to a class setting. Um, and so today, yeah, we're going to talk for like 15, 20 minutes. Hope just not to bore you. <laughs> yeah, but I'm trying to give you some of the theory behind it before we actually do the class so that you can come away from today and start to develop your own mobility practice um, rather than just coming today and doing something but not actually learning kind of why we're doing it. So um, Alex is going to now go into what mobility is. Yeah. Yeah, so again, if we talk about, you know, what is mobility, I just want to make sure that we're kind of on the same page and defining that up front. Um, you know, I would say, and again, this is based on the functional range systems, kind of how, how they look at mobility, but mobility is um, the, just the amount of active and usable motion that you can control in any given joint. Okay, so again, let's unpack that a little bit. The keywords being active usable and control okay so active i'm talking about active range of motion versus a passive range of motion so if i lay down on my back i've got my strap and i use the strap to put myself into passive hip flexion that's passive hip flexion i'm not really creating that so much on my own i'm using external forces to go into that this would be more my active range of motion for that specific joint position Okay, so we've got passive versus active. So mobility refers more to your ability, your active ability to get there yourself. And thus, because you're getting there yourself, it's more usable. Like you might have loads of passive range of motion, do, you know, cool positions and poses, but you, they're not really usable because you're, in order for something to be usable, you have to have the strength there, and then you also have to have the neurological control in that position. So that's where the control comes in. Yeah, so if we think, think of mobility, you, it's active, so thus you can actually use the range of motion and you have control over your body parts there in whatever joint position, multi-joint position that you're in. And so that kind of leads us a little bit to like, you know, definition that's often used in FRC or like an equation of that mobility equals flexibility plus strength and control. Now, I don't want to bash on flexibility necessarily or passive range of motion. I know that there's different types of flexibility. Think of mobility as more in the active flexibility range. So once again, if you have a passive range of motion, that's great because that is actually a prerequisite for having mobility. If I 
you know, say I've got great, you know, passive shoulder flexion, someone can take my arm and put it overhead, that's great, because that gives me movement potential, movement capacity to passively be put in that position. And then I got to look at my active, my active shoulder flexion, maybe it's only here, and then you start backfilling that gap um, with strength and control, and so that you're actually owning whatever passive range of motion that you have. So flexibility plus strength and control. So again, flexibility, the ability to be moved into a position, mobility is more the ability, the ability to get there on your own with strength and control. Um, what else do I want to say about mobility? You know, because passive range of motion doesn't necessarily mean that you can move there or that you can ex execute any strength, that your body has any control over that. And that those kind of gaps between passive and active range of motion, I think David is going to talk a little bit later about injury prevention and mitigation having those gaps in your ranges of motion really can set you up for, um, for injury. Because if you happen to get you know, chronic injuries, you're, you're constantly going into a passive range of motion or a flexibility position that your nervous system doesn't know how to control, generate force, it doesn't know how to be safe there. Um, and, and also just, you know, preparing your body, we, you know, we don't, you know, we do very specific exercises, but you might step off the curb if you've never, you know, trained your ankle in any specific ranges of motion, that can be an acute injury that occurs between having a big gap in passive and active ranges of motion. Um, I mean, that's kind of all I had to say about what mobility is. You can think of it kind of like a, mobility is a, let's try to think, like an external display <laughs> of the internal capability of, of your joints. Okay, it's like an expression of how you can move your joints actively. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to my <laughs> uh, no, that, that's good. mobility that's really good. conversation? <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, and then so following on from that, I'm going to talk about why you should care. <laughs> why so like, why would you want mobility? Um, so I'll start by talking a bit about why I care about mobility. And you, some of you might relate to that. So like I said, I'm a CrossFit athlete. And um, we try, well, we have, our joints have to bear a lot of load, whether it's our body weight or whether it's a barbell or a dumbbell or a kettlebell. Um, we ask our joints to um, create a lot of force and handle uh, huge forces. And the problem is, if you don't have mobility and the load is greater than your joint's capacity to absorb that load, that's how you get an injury. And so, say for example, all you do to improve your mobility um, is passive stretching, then you're not training your joints to actually uh, create any force in those positions. And so when you're forced into that position, say when you're doing a muscle up or maybe a back squat, um, and you go into that range of motion, then the tissues aren't able to then um, support that load and then that's how you can end up getting an injury. Um, so from a performance perspective as a CrossFitter, it's going to help me avoid injury, but it also helps me lift more um, and control those ranges better. Um, so whereas sometimes, like before I started really training mobility, I would find um, sometimes with some of my lifts, I would kind of like try to almost bounce out of the bottom and I'd feel very unstable. Like now I have a lot more control in, in those positions um, and a lot more stability as well. Um, apart from just pure performance aspect of it, uh, mobility is really important just for general health. So some of you might not be athletes. Um, some of you might just be human beings. <laughs> just well, human beings. Well, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry to be there. <laughs> might uh, just be a human being. Well, what I meant to say was like mobility <laughs> is important for all human beings, whether you're an athlete or not. Um, so, yeah, if we don't move our joints, then they can become very stiff. And also, you need to move your joints to actually get nutrients into the cartilage um, and the ligaments and around that joint and that tissue. And so every day that you don't use your joint in a certain position, your body's going to start um, like not preserving the tissues necessary to get into that position. Um, and that can lead nicely on to, Alex is now gonna to talk to you about uh, controlled articular rotations yeah. and also a little bit about her yoga background 
Okay. Yeah. So I think Dave and I work really well together because while he's from um, you know more of like the CrossFit and strength and maybe trying to uh, make sure that ranges of motion are adequate for lifts or various you know exercise movements that you do. So my perspective is a little bit more where which I alluded to at the beginning, where I come from more of a yoga background, where largely the focus is on passive flexibility. Although I mean I was lucky enough to have a yoga instructor. Um, who was very well versed in anatomy and always taught us how to be strong in the yoga postures that but that still doesn't mean yoga is largely finding kind of gravity the floor ways to manipulate your body into certain or using other limbs to manipulate your body into certain positions your positions that you probably don't have active, active control of so so my background a little bit kind of comes in more for for myself of I had all these crazy passive ranges of motion but then massive, huge gaps, very humbling between what I could kind of force my body into versus what I could um, you know, actively control. So that's how I got into um, functional range conditioning training and into that. And it's, I've seen, even though I still do some of those crazy postures, although not as much as I used to, I see like amazing uh, differences in, in, in just thinking about being strong in those positions. How much can I actively put myself into them before I go into the pose instead of just trying to like yank everything around and do, and do whatever. I mean, I'm not trying to bash yoga. It's just a different perspective. And I'm often working a lot to strengthen my, because my passive is here, active is here. So a lot of techniques to, to be strong in, in the passive range of the motion that I have. So that's my background kind of and where the perspective I come in from, uh, from FRC. And like David was saying, like joints need to move. So the synovial joints, they need to get nutrients in, they need to get waste products out. And it is like the use it or lose it principle. You know, it's not like, oh, when I was a kid, I used to be able to do wheel pose. And you know, it's not just because you're old. Sorry, you can't necessarily always use that as an excuse. But a lot of it is you're just not putting your joints, you're not in those positions um, any longer. And your body wants to conserve energy. It's not going to preserve ranges that you don't use or that you rarely use. So, which brings us to CARS, which is an acronym for controlled articular rotation. So seriously, the, like the most, the best thing that you can do for your joints, for joint health and joint just general maintenance, is to move your joints through their current available range of motion on a daily basis, if not more than once a day, as, as frequently as possible. And so these controlled articular rotations are really one of like the uh, foundational things that we that we do in, um, in FRC and also that we, we do quite a bit in kin stretch classes because we're looking to take whatever joint it is through its current active um, outer limits of its range of motion and isolate the movement in that joint. So we want joint independence. If we're doing shoulder cars, we don't want your thoracic spine moving. We don't want your scapula moving. You want to see what your shoulder joint is capable of, capable of doing and where it's able to move and where it's not able to move. So these cars can serve as a self-assessment tool for just looking at, at movement patterns in your body and where they might be lacking. And certainly when we go into our practice session, we, we will be doing some cars. <laughs> we will be doing some cars. Um, and so when you're doing cars frequently, because you're, you're moving the joint through its, its full available range of motion, pain-free and compensation-free, the, the joint capsule itself is full of mechanoreceptors with the, which relay like multi-directional information to your nervous system so you know where that, where that body, where that, where that body part is in space. And this is very uh, essential information for the nervous system. So if I'm doing my shoulder car, which we'll be doing earlier, you know, I'm really trying to come into shoulder adduction, coming up into shoulder flexion, maxing out that, internally rotating, going back around and so on and so forth. So I'm, you know, uploading all of this information to my nervous system about how I can, how my shoulder joint can move, where it can go, where it can't. And um, other thing about cars is really the, ro the rotary component, the rotational component is, is essential for, for joints, is the fundamental movement of the joints in the body with the exception of the spine, which is flexion. And if, and for the, the bigger joints, like the ball and socket joints, like the hip and shoulder, the kind of the fundamental base movement there is internal rotation. And uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit about this when we do some cars or capsule cars in our practice, but um, the amount of rotational ability like you have, say the hip joint, you know, the femur head here and the acetabulum, if there's not much rotational um, 
capability there, there's not much workspace. And you can also think of workspace in the joint, again, as kind of a movement potential. If workspace is limited in that joint, meaning there's not much rotation, then that's going to impact linear movements as well. So the good thing, and we, in, in FRC, we focus, we prioritize rotational training over linear training. And there's not, I mean, I think in most fitness stuff, there's not a whole lot of emphasis on actually training rotation. We do a lot of linear movements. And um, you know, here we're looking to really make sure that the joint can rotate well and that you're strong in rotation positions and really training rotation then translates into strength and rotation, obviously, but also gives you uh, gains in linear movements as well. I know I'm like oh, talking fast. Anything miss missing there in, in cars and rotational training? Um, not that I, I will practice some cars. Some of a lot of you are on the, have done cars in uh, in classes with me or mm -hmm. online before. So. I just wanted to add about mobility and flexibility. Mobility is more permanent um, because you have the strength. So you actually have like built muscle and tendons Nervous and fascia system. Um, to like, yeah, and you've made that connection with the nervous system. system. Mm -hmm. Um, to go into those ranges and your body feels a lot safer there. So a lot of times our bodies or our nervous system will prevent you going into certain ranges um, to prevent injury. So if you actually add that mobility rather than just flexibility, uh, then you'll find you probably might not need to warm up as much when you're trying to do certain movements. Uh, that range will be much more easily accessible and as long as you keep doing your mobility training, um, you'll you'll be able to keep it more easily. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Because sometimes if like people are like, oh gosh, my hip flexors are so tight, so I just need to stretch, 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 and you aren't getting any progress in your hip flexors feeling better or less tight or whatever you want to call it, or not getting much range there, it could be that. Like David said, you need, you need to teach your nervous system that you can be strong there because often weak muscles feel tight because it's a self-protection. It's your body is trying to protect itself. So I'm not talking about doing like big lifts on your hip flexors, but just, you know, we do a lot of isometric um, work, which you'll see in, in the sample kin stretch class. Isometrics are great because they, they help overcome the, the stretch reflex, which is what David said when you go into a position, you're like, oh. I can't move there, that's your nervous system saying it doesn't feel safe there. So isometrics help you slightly overcome that. Isometrics are really safe because you're, you're creating the tension, you're not using um, external load. Um, good way to build strength and connection there um, in these positions. Yeah, so the last <laughs> thing we were gonna talk about before starting our actual practice was, um, apart from CARS, some other sort of acronyms. <laughs> so there's lots of acronyms and in FRC. <laughs> Or they're not so much specific exercises, they're more like concepts because you can apply them to any joint yeah. and um, any, any sort position, of position. Yeah. yeah. So uh, some of you may have heard of PALES and RAILS before. PALES uh, stands for Progressive Angular Isometric Loading and RAILS is the same except for Regressive Angular Isometric Loading. So it's an isometric contraction, which means you're contracting the muscle but there's no movement. So say for example, when I'm like pushing my hands together, my chest is contracting, but nothing's moving, so it's isometric. Uh, the progressive angle is, that all that means is that's the side of the joint that's stretching or lengthening. Um, so when you're doing a pales contraction, you're contracting what's stretching. The rails or the regressive angle, that just refers to the opposite side that is shortening. So a rails contraction is contracting the side of the joint that is shortening, and it's the opposite of the pale side. Um, so you so, can use this example. <laughs> okay, typical yeah. hamstring stretch. So here, uh, if Alex was to do a pales contraction, she would be engaging what's lengthening, so that would be the glutes and hamstrings, sort of that side of the joint. Yeah. And then a rails contraction would be contracting on her hip flexors on the opposite side. So why do we do these? Pails and rails, we use those to improve our flexibility. So as we were saying, mobility is flexibility plus strength and control. You do need that flexibility first. If you don't have a passive range of motion, then you can't then make it active. So why does pails and rails work? Well, first of all, you need to actually passively stretch for like at least two minutes 
for your nervous system to kind of wake oh, up that and pay stretch, attention. Yeah, that stretch reflex. Yeah. To override that initial stretch reflex. Yeah. yeah. And then we do the pails to send a signal to your nervous system and let it know that you can produce force in that end range. And then often you'll find after you've done your pails contraction, it'll then let you go a little bit further. Then we do the rails contraction to try and add that strength and control um, to that range. Um, so when we're doing pails and rails, uh, and we will do some uh, in our practice, uh, so you passively stretch, try and relax as much as possible uh, for at least two minutes. And then you can do as many sets of pails and rails as you like, but only anything more than three is kind of <laughs> hard. But, um, it, can yeah. be a, uh, it can be intense. It is strength training for your joints. Remember that. This isn't mm -hmm. just like some silly like little joint circles and move around. This is yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then normally you do maybe 15, 20 second pails effort straight into maybe 10, 15 second rails effort. And then it's important that you again stretch passively um, mm -hmm. to allow your nervous system to get accustomed to this new range of motion. Um, one more thing I want to talk about with pails and rails is irradiation. Yeah. And um, that's also relevant to pretty much everything that we do in mobility training. Um, irradiation is basically when you contract one muscle, it starts to recruit the muscles next to it. And also the more muscles that you contract at one time, the more force that you can produce. Um, so when we're doing our pails and rails, you want to create tension in the rest of your body. Almost imagine you're doing like a heavy back squat or a deadlift. Yes, it's like that prep and yeah, And you like create like some intra-abdominal pressure, breathe into your belly. Um, try and like squeeze all the muscles you can. Sometimes we like will squeeze like a yoga block or a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball or <laughs> yeah. anything to create that extra tension. And because um, like we said, it is just it's just strength training for your joints, and um, that's how you're going to be able to create the most force and create the most gains. Um, so once you say you have the flexibility that you want. Uh, you have the passive range of motion and you want to make that active. Uh, you want to start doing some end range control training. So uh, a couple of examples of that would be a passive range hold where you take the joint to its passive range, and you try and hold it and then slowly let go. Um, another example would be a lift off. So you're like almost in your end range. Um, uh, I'll just do a quick example. Say with my internal rotation, um, I'm like, you get to a point where I only have a tiny bit of uh, internal rotation lift off, and you're trying to strengthen that range there. Um, and then on top of that, you can do hovers. So instead of just doing like uh, your lift offs in a linear fashion, you can start to hover over objects to add a bit more rotational okay. control. Um, and you can also do little end range rotations as well. Um, so I think that's enough talking. <laughs> enough talking. Unless you have something to add. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. I think cool. Um, and so, guys, if you have any questions about any of what we just talked about, um, please write it down. You can even like send us a message. I think on on mm -hmm. Zoom or Facebook, and we'll come back to it. At, at yeah, the end. and it is it, do, it is a lot of information. But if you think about it a little bit, like we're used to thinking of strength training for muscles, like okay, you you know if you if you um wanted to you know, get stronger in your biceps, you wouldn't just go grab a tiny little weight and just do a few reps casually once a week. So this, that idea of still like progressive overload, strength and conditioning for muscles applies to joint training as well too. So again, all these, all these terminology might be a bit confusing, but it, a lot of the principles are, are, very, are very similar. So just if that yeah. sounded like, it's not once, once you kind of get the, 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 you know, the system and you, um, and you understand kind of uh, the, the physiology behind it uh, that you have to. You can always go to classes and, and of course, work with, work with people like us that are trained in this. It, it, it really makes sense. And it's also easy, I mean, I think, maybe not initially, but easy to put it into your daily practice. It's not like, oh, gosh, I don't know where to fit all this mobility stuff into your practice. But bits and bits can be put into your regular training, especially if you're looking at joint prerequisites that you don't currently have for your strength training, for your just your daily life, or... Yeah, so <laughs> it's cool. doable. I don't want to sound like it's like all these all these acronyms and all these terms that sound fancy. It's um, work with someone who knows what they're doing, and it's it'll it becomes a bit more um, uh, manageable. Yeah.
Okay, that being said, let's move. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I wouldn't stand up. Let's just adjust some of these camera angles here. Okay, make sure we can see you know, if our heads are cut off. You don't need to see our heads, do you? <laughs> All right, so we're going to do some controlled articular rotations for some of our upper body joints. Uh, we, don't, we won't do all of them, though. All right, so take about a shoulder width stance or maybe slightly wider. And we're going to start with the neck. So I want you to imagine from below your neck down, your body is a statue and create about 30% tension in the rest of your body so you can just squeeze your fists about 30%, squeeze your glutes, squeeze your quads. All right, now start by tucking your chin to your chest. Now, I want you to start to reach your chin towards your right armpit and just slowly rotate. Now start looking over your right shoulder. Now drop your ear to your back pocket, start to look up. Then you're going to look across the ceiling, reach your ear to your other back pocket, look over your left shoulder, reach your chin for your armpit, and back through the middle. We're going to do one more repetition this direction. Imagine you're moving through like really thick air and you're keeping a nice steady cadence. And also try to expand the circle with each repetition. Now, one thing to mention with your cars is you want to avoid closing angle joint pain. All right, once you finish that circle, let's go in the opposite direction. So reach your chin for your left armpit, look over your left shoulder, and continue this rotation. So you don't want to feel any pinching on the side of the joint that is uh, shortening. So Alex will continue the cars there. Um, so say, for example, in my neck cars, I feel a pinch when I'm leaning over this way. You want to avoid that. So you're going to have to make your circle a little bit smaller and then just continue like that. Uh, if you have closing angle joint pain, you're not actually improving like your mobility. You're not getting any sort of stretch. It's just like the joint capsule itself and the two bones are kind of running into each other. So you can't, there's no point in pushing through that. All right, we are gonna move on to our shoulder blades. So hold your hands out about 45 degrees. <laughs> All right, first what we're gonna do is shrug up to your ears. Now I want you to push your shoulder blades forward, like reach forward with your hands then shrug away from your ears and then pull your shoulder blades back together. Then come up and now make this into a rotational movement. We're going to do a couple more reps in this direction. It's very common on these to bend your elbows, so just check that the elbows are straight because we want all the just the scapula moving. Sorry, I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt. No. But I just always notice that my elbows went to bed, so we yeah, want definitely. joint independence here. <laughs> yeah, so with all of our cars, we're trying to only move the joint that you're doing the cars for. All right, so pause with your ear shrug, with your <laughs> shoulder shrug to your ears. Let's reverse directions. Pull your shoulder blades back. And down, forward, and up. Yeah, so we need our joints need to learn how to work independently before they work well uh, with other joints. Otherwise, you can end up with compensations, and you can have some joints trying to perform the function of other joints, which they're not really designed for, and that's how you can sometimes get injured. All right, that is enough. Scapula cars. All right, now we are moving on to, uh, well, actually, first we'll do some shoulder capsule cars. All right, so I want you to look like a cactus. So, uh, <laughs> Gold Coast arms, cactus arms. Elbows, yeah, elbows out to the side. Now imagine your elbows are resting on like a shelf and they can't move up or down. I just want you to rotate your shoulders. So let's start by internally rotating. Get as much as you can just in the shoulder. Make sure you're not this doing this. So keep the shoulder yeah. blades on your back. And then let's Pulse externally inside. rotate. Inside. And let's go back into internal rotation. So yeah, don't don't let the shoulder blades move or don't move from your uh, spine at all. We're just focusing on the shoulder here. Now as you go into external rotation, fight for a little bit more this time if you can. You may notice differences side to side. Let's go back into internal rotation. 
And let's do one more each direction. So if you're noticing like you don't have that much rotational movement in your shoulders doing these, then that's you might find you have limitations in your shoulder in general. So you might find to show with flexion or extension because rotation is like the fundamental. Yeah, movement. if you're so, talking about a little bit with the workspace might be lacking in the joint. You have to address the rotation um, first and then you can address the other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, so now we know how to internally and externally rotate. Well. We are going to do, yeah. Well, yeah, no, 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 I'm just saying, yeah, no, 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 I'm just saying in general with people, like, you know, like with the rotation, because, like, for example, the shoulder has just like massive range of motion. It's not that you just should be able to rotate there in shoulder abduction 90 degrees, but all, all around, there should be rotation. The humerus should be able to rotate there in the glenoid fossa. I mean, there just should be rotation. So, okay. okay no, <laughs> there just, just, just should be rotation. That's all I think. Yeah. This is like the only movement. Yeah, no, it's yeah. one of many movements. So, okay. Yeah, no, good point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So, Let's do a, a shoulder car, so the entire shoulder car. Yeah. I'm All right. So. Position okay. Way. Yeah. So we don't hit each other. All right. So let's do our right arm. You can maybe take your left arm to your rib cage, so that you notice if you're moving your spine at all during this movement. All right. So externally rotate. So turn your bicep forward. Now we're going to start by adducting. So bring your arm across. Try and like reach your bicep for your chin, and then come into flexion. Try to get as much flexion as you can without using your spine. So keep keep your abs engaged. Now, once you can get no more flexion, start to internally rotate and reach back behind you. So this time, now you're turning your bicep towards the floor. Trying to make as big a circle as you can. Keep reaching back. Now we're in shoulder extension. Then we're gonna finish with our arm by our side. Now hold this internal rotation, so palm. bicep, yeah, uh, palm should be facing back. If you had the fingers open, yeah. Or um, bicep pointing towards your body. <laughs> We're going to come into extension, get as much extension as you can, and then start to externally rotate. So turn your palm to face the ceiling. Keep externally rotating as we come back through flexion, and then adduction and then finish by our side. Let's do, I think, yeah, we'll go to the other side yeah. now. We'll just Showing do one the on the other side. Showing the side here, so. All right, so get that external rotation, palm facing forward, bicep facing forward, create that tension in the rest of your body. Now bring the arm across, adduction in the shoulder. Keep that rotation as you come into flexion. Max out flexion and then start internally rotating. Another common thing is to lean over to the side in this portion. So just make sure your torso is staying still. All right. And we're going to reverse directions. Hold that internal rotation. Get as much extension as you can. And then externally rotate. Keep that tension in the rest of your body. Come back through flexion. Keep trying to rotate as you come back through adduction and finish by your side. Okay, so that's just an example of some controlled articular rotations for a few of our joints in the upper body. And now we're going to move on to some pails and rails for our wrist extension. So a lot of people need wrist extension. If you do push-ups, you need it. If you do any sort of handstands, burpees, um, any overhead pressing, even for bench press, you need some. Um, so we're gonna do some pails and rails. So I want you to point your fingers towards you. So yeah, this position, and then place your palms on the mat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay. So the more you sit back towards your heels, the more stretch you're gonna feel in your forearms. I want you to find a stretch where it's a nice good stretch, but it's not like unbearable. So if it's so painful that you can't really relax, then that's too far. Now, when we're doing these passive stretches, we want to try and relax as much as we can, slow our breathing down. So it's kind of the opposite of irradiation. <laughs> it's like anti-irradiation. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just big full breaths in just to calm the yeah. nervous system down uh, in the stretch so that you can get it. Yeah. 
more more in the kind of let you in a bit more into the position. Yeah. And we're just gonna hold this for another minute or so. <laughs> Going for the whole two minutes. <laughs> yeah, this is the more this and, is the more relaxing part of the class. <laughs> and just where we you know we're not just pulling you know, two minutes out of our butt. Um, that's what per current, so a lot of the, the FRC uh, system is based on current, uh, current uh, scientific research. So, which basically shows for, <clears throat> for stretching to get kind of this override, the stretch reflex, at least two minutes is needed. Um, so that's, that's why kind of the two minutes is used as a general benchmark for, um, for sitting in a passive stretch if you do want to get some or longer term benefit out of it. You want to go beyond the stretch reflex and then, and then, and then start training more actively that, that range that you might have opened up. Yeah. I was just trying to talk there as well to make the time go by. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. No, when I, when I do the hails and rails, I'll like normally watch something on, on YouTube or something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. So now our pails in this position is going to be pushing through our palm and our fingers also. So you're engaging this side that we're stretching. Then the rails, you're gonna squeeze the opposite side. So squeeze behind your wrist, trying to pull yourself even deeper into that stretch. All right, so take a deep breath. Create some intra-abdominal pressure. So basically um, squeeze your abs, pack the breath in your stomach. Now about 20% effort. We're going to start easily and then we're going to increase the, inten the intensity. Start pushing through your palm and also your fingers at the same time. All right now, gradually start to increase that effort. So come up to maybe 40% effort. And let's go to 60%. Now create tension in the rest of your body. So maybe kick your feet into the floor, contract your chest muscles, contract your abs. All right, hold that 80% effort. Push, push, push. Like you could dent the floor, three, two, one, switch to rails. All right, trying to pull yourself deeper into the stretch. By contracting kind of the muscles in the forearms. So now yeah. we're trying to, at the front of the, uh, the wrist joint, trying to actively pull yourself, yeah. Yep, yeah. and three, two, one. Okay, relax everything. Slow your breathing back down. You might be able to go a little bit further now into this wrist extension. Should we do one more set? Maybe the other time, no. Okay. Unless well, you really want to. Uh, uh, no. We'll no, like no, we'll do one more. Right, Just give you an idea of, of uh, pails and rails and that position. So that was one set of pails and rails. Um, and you could have, we could have gone on to do another set or two of that um, as long as you're, yeah, as long as you're not feeling any pain. Yeah, you, you always want to listen to your body when you're doing this stuff. Um, like stretching itself can be kind of painful, but it's like a stretching sensation. Um, anything that feels sketchy or anything that feels like pinchy or even like nervy <laughs> type of pain, you want to avoid that. Uh, all right, so now we've done some pails and rails. Uh, I think we'll just go on to spinal segmentation. Okay, yeah. So I just right. want to say something, can I just say something really yeah. quick about the pails and rails? So just until you get the, um, I mean, you, you mentioned this before, but the, the wrist is a pretty easy one to kind of get the overall strategy of that. The pails contraction is trying to, I think of pails as push. You're trying to push yourself out of that joint position. And like you're saying, rails is trying to actively pull yourself deeper into the position for using you know, the tissue on either side of the joint, which we also showed in that hip flex or the hamstring stretch position as well too. So again, like when you come deeper into wrist extension, you're not trying to do it just by leaning your torso back, but by squeezing all the stuff in your forearms to actively pull yourself um, into deeper wrist extension. So, yeah. And that's just one example. You can do pails in any joint position, rails, whatever it is you're trying to work on. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Because <laughs> sometimes it's a little bit, you know, what are we, what are we doing yeah. here and, and why? And you, it can be hard to like feel that rails contraction, especially when you're first starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and but, then we should just do a you guys should just do a test on yourself to see how much uh, wrist extension you actively own. Because if you come from here and then you pull your fingertips up, keeping the elbows straight, think of like what position you would be in for plank or handstand. And it's just interesting to know, like you know, plank requires ninety degrees of wrist extension. If even if you don't actively own that, you keep jamming your body weight or more weight into that. Again, that's just an example of how 
you know, injuries can occur because you're loading a joint position that you don't actively have control over. Okay. Yeah. That's all I'm saying on that. Okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so let's move on. We're, we're going to do some um, segmented cat camel for our spine. Can you so, give an example? Do you want to do a show? Do you want to show um, um, teach while I'm moving? Would that be easier to show? Um, yeah, we could try that. Go right okay, over. yeah, so if you go maybe. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, first I'll just talk through it. Yeah. Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, with your. Every joint except your spine, rotation is the mm -hmm. fundamental movement. With your spine, it's flexion and extension. And our spine is kind of designed so that each vertebrae or each segment takes a, a little bit of the load when we go into flexion mm -hmm. or extension. Uh, what can often happen is you get like quite a significant maybe section of your spine that doesn't have much movement and then the will be kind of like a hinge point on either side um, and that point ends up taking more flexion or more force uh, than it's really supposed to because it's trying to compensate for those other sections. So spinal segmentation uh, and this is I guess considered like the, the daily cars for your spine mm -hmm. um, can be a great way to start to improve that segmentation and uh, make your spine healthier. Yeah. Okay, so Alex is going to go well, on. Just gonna say, if, you, if you just want to, like, it's yeah. easier that way. It's hard to talk while your head is down. Yeah, so start on your hands and knees. And first of all, I want you to actually come into global flexion. So stick your uh, back <laughs> up in the air and try to round everything as much as you can. Okay, so we're going to start at the bottom, and Alex is going to keep her mid and upper back still. And she's just going to start to tilt her pelvis and stick her butt out and try to <laughs> yeah. get a movement just right in the uh, lower back. In the lumbar, yeah. yeah. And then we're gonna make our way slowly up. So we'll make our th way through the low back, come through the middle, and then upper, and then look up, and then trying to get as much ex global extension as possible. All right, now we're gonna keep, again, mid and lower back still and just, oh sorry, mid and upper back still and just start to tuck the tailbone back under, come back into flexion in the lumbar spine and then like a chain reaction is making your way up. And then, so yeah, so it's similar like maybe from a yoga background, you guys probably know cat cows, it's like you end up in the similar positions but you're trying to move like, like vertebra by vertebra basically yeah. like David mentioned, yeah. And we'll do one more rep this direction, so. Again, try and just tilt <laughs> the tailbone as best you can. And you're not gonna get a huge amount of movement from each vertebrae. It's gonna be just a tiny amount of movement from each one that contributes to the entire movement. All right, and then make your way back, tuck the tailbone under, really try and feel each segment going one at a time or even if you could do like low, middle, and upper, that's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes right. it's hard to feel where you're actually moving or not. Yeah. And we'll pause here and we'll get, try uh, one rep in the opposite direction. So Alex is going to keep her lower mid back still, start by looking up, then start to extend the upper back. Oh, this direction. Yeah. <laughs> and then make her way through the middle. Nice job. And lower back, good. All right, keep, keep the lower and middle back still, tuck the chin, and then start to flex the upper back. Nice job. And make your way all the way back down to the tailbone. And now you can relax. <laughs> Yeah. So what I say, body control and awareness. <laughs> That's why we move slow, so you can try to um, control over your joints. Again, because yeah, like they were saying, the spine in particular, think of like a spine is one thing. It's not It's not one thing, it's, it's multiple joints and each of those joints need to have some movement capability. Because like, I mean, I suffer personally from a very big hinge point at my, uh, uh, where the thoracic spine meets the lumbar spine. I've worked a lot to be able to get more movement back into the lumbar vertebra. I had a lot of back pain, which 
possibly, you know, I don't know for sure, was from just having that hinge point there and having no mobility, uh, very limited mobility in the lumbar vertebra. Yeah. And then from like maybe a CrossFit <coughs> perspective, um, if you can, if you have good segmentation in your spine, it's probably inevitable that your, your spine is going to be forced into a position outside of neutral. So we're always trying to maintain <laughs> neutral spine when we're yeah. doing deadlifts, squats, um, cleans, whatever. But, you know, when we're going for that PR or maybe when we're tired, it's inevitable that we sometimes come into flexion or maybe we extend. Um, and if you have good segmentation, then hopefully your spine will be able to manage that load. Yeah. and be more resilient and resistant to injury. Yeah, perfect. Okay, now Alex is gonna take over. Oh, we're going to bear sit. I just wanna say we do, for those of you that are on, there's some people on Instagram live, I think that has like a hard cut off at for 60 minutes. So if you, when you get, you're probably gonna go over 60 minutes. So if you wanna rejoin on Facebook live or Zoom, that information is in my profile. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some hips. And I wanted to start with some hip cars. Okay, so there's, there's quite a few different base positions that we can do hip cars in. Um, and I think for purposes of this, uh, let's come into a side lying position. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna lie here. So you're gonna lie on your left side. Or you don't have to do them, David, if you want. Or you could, you could show quadruped. <laughs> See a nice relaxing position here on your side. You're gonna have your right hip stacked over your left hip. If you have a, a pillow or a yoga block, you can use that underneath your head. I'm just gonna rest my head on my left arm. And so knees directly in front of the hips, got the legs at like a 90 degree angle. And this is opposite arm, just press that hand down on the floor to create a little bit of tension. And I'm gonna lift that right leg up a bit. I'm gonna pull into hip flexion. So I'm gonna pull my right knee towards my right arm. Make sure you can see here, right knee towards my right arm. Make sure you're not rounding your spine. Because again, with cars, we want only the, the joint of interest moving. And then we're gonna open up, this is called hip abduction, like a frog position. Make sure you're not leaning back through the pelvis, hips stay remain, uh, relatively stacked. From here, internally rotate the hip, so my thigh will turn kind of forward and in, the right foot will move back behind me a bit. And make sure you're not arching here into the low back. You're gonna control that right leg as it moves back and down. And let's go one more time this direction. This is hip flexion, bringing the knee in towards the right arm, open up into hip abduction. Squeeze that right outer hip to maximize this distance between the knees. And then internally rotate from here. Use the right glute to extend the hip a bit. Control that right leg through space. Okay, and once we get the knees over on top of each other, let's go in reverse. So come into hip extension, we often cheat hip extension with lumbar spine. So make sure you're not extending or arching into the low back. Really feel that right glute working for you here. It's not a huge movement. And then drive the right knee up. So there's external rotation here. And then pull the right knee towards the right arm, finishing up in hip flexion. Let's go one more time this direction. Okay, so again, don't arch into the low back. Use the glute on the right side. Externally rotate here, right knee comes up, right ankle kind of sweeps underneath, back to this froggy shape, and then pull the right knee towards the right arm. Good. All right, and rest. And let's switch to the other side. So you should feel your hips getting warm, even with just a couple of circular movements like that. Pretty intense. Okay. So sure. Yeah, you can do, yeah, David can show different <laughs> variations. Oh, Sideline's kind of nice, you're kind of relaxed, but I still want I want still want some good work here. Okay, so left hip stacked on top of the right hip. I'm gonna lift that left leg up a bit, pull the left knee in towards the left arm. So feel the muscles here on the front of the hip, the hip flexor's working, and then outer hip, come into hip abduction. <laughs> Inter I'm gonna kick you internally, rotate, control your left leg in space, lower down, one more time this way. And pull into hip flexion, don't make it be a spine thing. Hip abduction, maximize the distance between the knees and then internally rotate. Left foot will move behind slightly. Squeeze that left glute to control the left hip. And once we're back at the starting spot, we're gonna go in reverse. Work that left glute, hip extension. Don't go into the low back, externally rotate. Left knee drives high. Pull, 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 left knee towards left arm. Last one. Okay, so it's our controlled articular rotations for the hip from a sideline position. Many different ways of doing these. Okay, last little bit here. 
Good. And relax. Okay, now this position here, hip abduction, we're going to create that from a seated position. Okay, so you're going to have a seat, take the legs apart, and it's not the most like flattering position. It's called bear sit. I don't know, I've never really seen a bear sit like this, but I mean, maybe they do. Maybe they do. So we're coming into some amount of hip flexion here, hip abduction. You just take your arms inside your legs, grab onto your ankles. So if you feel like you're falling back or you feel a lot of pinching in the front of your hips, you could definitely elevate your hips on a block. Or you can even kind of lean a bit against a wall here just to make it a little bit easier for you to sit up tall. Okay. And since we're, you know, about some time, I'm going to do one round of pails and rails in this position again, just so we did pails and rails in wrist extension. This is also a very good position to kind of understand what pails and rails is doing. So as David had said, pails is you're engaging the muscles or tissue that are lengthening or that are on stretch. So I'm guessing everyone can feel their <laughs> adductor muscles, inner thighs, that's what's on stretch. So when we come into the pales contraction, you're gonna think about closing your legs up or your arms are gonna be in the way blocking that movement. It's like you're gonna be fighting with your, with, the, <laughs> with your body parts, legs that wanna close in, arms are pushing out to prevent that movement. For the rails contractions, the kind of the muscles tissue that are, that are contracted or shortened here is more the outer hip tissue. So with the rails contraction, you're going to actively try to push your legs, try to widen your legs even further apart. Okay, and often cramping occurs in rails because the muscle tissue is already very, it's already contracted there. And often, again, we don't have a whole lot of strength in our end range. So cramping might occur. Just a little bit of a warning. Okay, so reach those arms inside your legs, hold onto your ankles, or you could also bring your hands together to block and elbows inside the knees to block the closing of the legs. Let's take a full breath in. Exhale out, pack the breath low, like someone is about to uh, punch you in the low belly. 10%, start trying to close those legs. 20%, building to 30%. And on these pales contractions, we ramp up the effort there. Just so you can feel what's going on, you gradually build your effort so you don't go in like at 100% and then not be able to hold it. So we need some time under tension for these uh, isometric contractions. Okay, 40 to 50%, shakes might start happening a little bit. I'm shaking here. <laughs> Let's go a little bit more, 60 to 70%. Try to close those legs in, make those adductors work here. Maybe a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Keep trying to close those legs up. Five, four, three, two, and one. Squeeze the outer hips. Try to push your legs further apart. Again, there's likely to be no movement here. That's not what matters. What matters is that you're now isometrically strengthening and contracting the muscles on the other side of the joint. Try to spread those legs. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. Take the arms back, one, and relax. <laughs> Just try to stay in the position. Just take a few deeper breaths, allow the nervous system to calm down. Maybe take the legs a little bit wider. And again, we can, it's not like you can pales and rails yourself into a contortionist. <laughs> you can over time, over with pales and rails, you can just start opening up little bits of uh, more passive range of motion. And then you, like you said, you can back build out with strength and control. Yeah, All right. Just Good. to mention, sorry, quickly. Um, mm -hmm. The key really is, is consistency. So. Well, I know it's not boring. <laughs> like, you have to do it a lot, like everything else. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, so like, it's hard to get the nervous system. It's hard to get change in, in tissue <laughs> and muscle, muscle yeah, tissue. Yeah, but it's similar. Like if you only squat once a month, you're not going to get stronger, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so good news. We're not doing another round of pails and rails. Bad news, maybe we're staying in bear sit. <laughs> okay, this time, this time have your hands behind you. So let's look at some hip capsule cars in this position. So I'm just going to demonstrate one first. If you haven't done them before, just look up here. So in internal rotation here of my right hip, I'm going to pivot either onto the heel or I could also plantar flex the ankle, turn the right thigh in. Only go so far as that you can keep the right sitting bone down because if I then lift up and allow, then that's getting other pelvis is turning, that's getting other joints involved here. So I just want to internally rotate through the right hip, bring the right knee towards the ground. Now don't think the knee has to go down. Make that internal rotation happen from the hip joint. Okay, so that's your kind of your internal rotation here in that right hip in this position. Okay. And then we're going to externally rotate back out. So just come back towards bear sit, squeeze the outer hip, maybe try to get a little bit wider in that right hip bear sit position. Let's go again, internally rotate. Sometimes there can be some inner knee pain in this position. Just 
Think of kind of isometrically dragging the right heel back towards your butt so the hamstrings stay a little bit engaged here. That may help, just, you know, depending on what issue is, is with your knee. And then externally rotate back out. Let's do one more on the right hip. Come into internal rotation. And as I said, we don't really train rotation. Internal rotation feels a little bit weird. <laughs> and, but it is, again, the fundamental movement of the hip joint. If you don't have lots of internal rotation, you're likely to have um, you know, just compromised uh, uh, range of motion in other positions and externally rotate back out. Let's go to the left hip. Internally rotating and don't let the left sitting bone lift up. And find that in range and try to like, you know, like fight for a little bit more <laughs> and externally rotate back out. Two more times, internally rotate. And these are called capsule cars because we're just rotating uh, the joint capsule there. And come back out. And last one. And come back to good old bear sit. Okay, moving on. So we're going to do some transitions between bear sit and a base position called 90-90. 90-90 is a common base position used in pin stretch classes and in some uh, functional range training because one hip is internally rotated, one hip is externally rotated. So it's a very like convenient position to train in. It's not the only one. And the good thing about FRC is with, you know, the principles are there. You don't need, these aren't like poses that you need to do. You just need to get your joint in a position that you want to work on. But 90-90 is pretty convenient for working on rotation. So this is what it's going to look like. We're going to start with internally rotating our right hip like we did previously. Keep the right sitting bone down for a moment. We find that in range, that strict internal rotation. And then allow the right sitting bone to come up. So right knee is going to go down. You're going to externally rotate your left hip. Huh. And whew, check your 90 degrees. So this is called 90-90. Both, both legs are in 90 degree angles. Okay. And then we're going to come back to bear sit. So stay heavy through the front leg, which is the left leg. It's externally rotated. You're going to start peeling that right knee up towards um, the roof, the roof, <laughs> the ceiling, where the sky, wherever you are. Maximize this distance between the knees. So again, really try to squeeze out as much range here, and then you're going to make your way back to bear sit. Okay, and the other hand can go behind. Let's go the other way. So internally rotate your left hip and move slow. Keep that left sitting bone down for a moment. Here, just internal rotation there in the left hip. Okay, and then allow the left hip or left sitting bone to lift up. Left knee goes down. Back hip is internally rotated. Externally rotate your right hip. Okay, stay heavy through that front leg, the right leg. Start to open that back hip up. It really squeeze out as much distance between the knees. And here we are making our way back to bear sit. Okay, we're going to do one more each direction. And um, I'm going to give you the option of not using your hands. I mean, it's kind of, you know, you use your hands to kind of help with balance and see where you're going in space. We can always try one together without using the hands. So let's interlace your hands in front. <laughs> and if this proves chal too challenging, then by all means, use your hands. Let's internally rotate the right hip. A little bit harder to control your legs and you don't have your hands to help with balance. Place the right knee down. Externally rotate the left hip. 90-90. Weight, keep pressure down on that front leg. Start to open the right knee back up as much distance between the knees, slowly making your way back to bear sit. Woo, keep your chest lifted, internally rotate the left hip. Slow, controlled, left knee goes down, right knee goes down. Okay, let's make our way back to bear sit one last time. We'll open that back hip. <laughs> Sound effects help and come back to bear sit. All right, and release the hands down. So we're going to do some work in 90-90. Let's, um, you guys can do the, the fancy transfer. Let's actually do that to get there together. Internally rotate your right hip, externally rotate your left hip, and then we're going to stay in 90-90. I'm just going to turn to face this way. Okay, so we're going to work a little bit on the front hip is in external rotation here. And if you find that you're always you're trying you're falling over to the side, you could elevate this left hip on a pillow, on a yoga block. Um, you could also kind of since we're not going to worry about the back leg for now, you could bend that back leg in in more. But I do really want you to try to have a 90 degree angle in this front leg, and that's because that's the most efficient way to stretch here at that hip capsule. This 90 degree angle. <clears throat> so we're going to stretch here. <laughs> so. 
you know, again, I have a lot of flexibility. I could just fold forward and just like probably fall asleep here. But I really want you to think about bowing the stretch. Think of tipping your pelvis forward, sticking that left glute out behind you so it's more anterior pelvic tilt. Draw your chest forward. Try to reach like beyond that left leg. Okay, so we're searching here for a stretch here Again, this left outer hip deep in the hip capsule. And again, there's not one perfect position that is gonna work for everyone. So you might be more upright, you might be more forward. You might wanna explore taking your hands a bit to the left, maybe a bit to the right, okay? Just you have to decide what position, keeping the only, the only constraints are, I want this leg in a 90 degree angle and I want your spine to be in a long and neutral position. Okay, we're just gonna take a few more breaths here, maybe not quite two minutes. <laughs> Ideally, we would stretch here for a couple of minutes. Just, just just smooth, steady, even breaths in, slow and full breaths out. Okay. Now stay in your stretch position. I'm just going to explain what we're going to do. So we are going to do a round of pails and rails here. And sometimes uh, pails and rails in this, in this position can be a bit tricky because I want it to be a rotational pails and rails. So if my hip is externally rotated here, the pales contraction is gonna to be to try to push out of that and internally rotate my hip. So for example, don't come out of the position, but say this is my leg on the floor, external rotation. So the pales contraction is as if I'm trying to rotate this direction, drive my, my foot and lower leg down through the floor. Okay, so you're gonna to start to get really heavy underneath that front ankle. Again, isometrics, nothing's gonna move. Let's give it a go. Okay, so let's stay in your passive stretch position. Take a full breath in. Exhale out, pack the breath low. 10 to 20%. Imagine there's a scale underneath this uh, left ankle. You're gradually increasing the weight down in that scale. Okay, so you think like 10 pounds, 20 pounds, or 10%, 20%, 30%. So you're trying to rotate out of this position. 40 to 50%. Again, think about like David mentioned on the other uh, pails and rails, get the upper body involved. You can push your hands down into the floor, push down into the back leg. We want to co-contract elsewhere to bring more strength to this uh, outer hip. Okay, so if someone tried to come pick your ankle off the ground, <laughs> there's no way because you're trying to drive down, turn down into the ground. Let's hold it there. Five, four, three, two, and one. Now get, try to get even heavier in the knee, try to actively externally rotate even more, maybe even pull yourself deeper into flexion. So now we're trying to actively turn the hip out for the rails contraction. So that imaginary scale underneath your left ankle, we're trying to take weight off of that. Okay, good, <laughs> five, four, three, two, and one. And just relax here and breathe. Again, you might find that you can get a little bit deeper into the stretch or maybe just have a bit more comfort in this stretch position. Okay. And like David said, if, if I was really working with a client or a class, we're really focusing on hip external rotation, we would do at least one more round of pails and rails. But for purposes of this, we're gonna do something even more fun than pails and rails. <laughs> it's called a passive range hold, okay? So you're gonna slide onto your left forearm, okay? And you can still kind of stay in this, I want the 90 degree angle still in that front leg, right leg, just be kind of relaxed in another position. So like um, we mentioned, there's often a big gap between passive and active ranges of motion. So you're gonna see one of my big gaps right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach underneath my left ankle with my right hand. I'm gonna keep the left knee heavy. I'm gonna come into passive external rotation. Now I don't expect you to look like this. And if, if, if like that ankle is just like not getting off the floor, you might have to even slide further out, okay? All right, so, or I don't know, have your, have your, have someone else come help you lift it up. All right, no, I'm just kidding. So again, even if you just get that ankle up a little bit, you might be here, that's your passive range because you're using that right arm to help pull you into a range of motion. Now let's see how much strength that you have in that range of motion. Okay, so try to keep the knee at 90 degrees. Make sure this left knee does not lift off the ground or left thigh. Okay, so in this passive range position, I want you to take a full breath in. Exhale out, start to create some tension and imagine that you could already lift your left ankle away from your right hand. And then you're gonna slowly let go of the support with the right hand. Try not to let the ankle drop. Make sure the left uh, thigh is staying down. Hold there, three, two, one. Regrab the ankle, 
reset to passive range. This is what I was talking about, how humbling, ridiculous passive range and passive range of motion is not so nice. I mean, it just, you know, it does, it's not, it's useless in some ways. Let's do that two more times. Take a full breath in, exhale out. Start squeezing everywhere. Slowly let go of that left ankle. I like to take my opposite hand to the knee so it doesn't jump up. Three, two, one. One last time. These are so fun. Okay, reset. Take a breath in. So create some tension. Because again, if you were doing a big lift, if you were totally relaxed, you just nothing would happen. You just lose the leg here. All right. So create some tension. Slowly let go. Fight to hold that ankle up. This time we're going to slowly lower down for five. Four, so control the eccentric. Three, I'm screaming. Two, and one. Okay. So what we're we saying, mobility training is not just like easy little joint circles. It's, it's really working on strengthening and controlling, uh, you know, whatever joint, whatever joint and surrounding tissue that we're we're, we're looking at. Okay, let's make our way into 90-90 on the second side. So we could do the cool little transfer if you want. So let's lift up the right knee, come back to bear sit. Externally rotate the left hip, or internally rotate the left hip, externally rotate the right hip. So I'm just going to turn around here so that you can see me. Okay, so again, really check that that right, right knee is in front of your right hip, right shin is parallel. You know, if you're on a mat, yoga mat, make that 90 degree angle happen. Okay. From here, we're going to search for your stretch in that right hip capsule. Okay. So again, think instead of scooping your butt under, more of like sticking it out behind you, more anterior pelvic tilt, like pull your belly forward, ribs, chest forward, try to lengthen your spine as best you can over that shin. Okay. And again, there's no one perfect stretch position here. You might find a bit more stretch if you're here with your hands. Go over here. <laughs> and stretching in some ways is a bit of a skill. Be able to kind of like move around and find a good stretch sensation. Okay, so we've got a few more breaths here. Yeah, and it's it's good to try different angles right. and mix yeah. it up. Mix it up, yeah, because if you only like if you just like if you only, I don't know, if you want to I don't want to make fun of squat, if you only squat within one position, I mean I like the perfect squat, but then there, you know, there's not much variability there if you're only stretching in one position or yeah. doing straight, you know. So if you train just one line of tissue, one line of tissue just yeah. over and over and over then that can lead to like overuse and injury. Whereas if you train different angles, um, they're all gonna make each other stronger. Yeah, and, uh, that's right. Create a healthier joint. Mm -hmm. in general. Okay, that's enough talking. Let's do our pails, our pails and rails contraction going into three passive range holds. Okay, so take a full breath in, exhale out, pack the breath low, and start with low effort, 10 to 20%. That imaginary scale underneath that right ankle getting heavier there. So you have to rotate this right leg through the floor. 30 to 40 percent, 50 to 60, get your upper body involved a little bit more, try to like dent the floor here with that right ankle, Maybe going a little bit more, 70 to 80 percent, let's hold there, hold there, five, four, three, two, and one. Now this right knee is going to stay super heavy, I'm going to try to get light underneath this imaginary scale underneath the right ankle. We're trying to actively turn the right hip, actually actively externally rotate even further. You can also think of pulling yourself further forward over that hip as well, over that leg. Five, four, three, two, and one. And breathe. Should we breathe here? <laughs> and it's gonna slide out onto that right forearm. Back a little bit here. Okay, so let's go for those passive range holds. So you're going to reach underneath the ankle with your left hand. Pull yourself into a, a passive external rotation. And again, it might, there might not be much lift off. That's fine. Okay. And we're going to take a breath in. At least like breathe and exhale. Kind of hold, start tensing, pack the breath down. Slowly let go of that ankle. Try not to let the height of the ankle drop. Three. Two and one, we grab the ankle, always reset back to your passive range. Like I have a huge gap there. So if I want to close that gap, I need to always try to reset to where, to where my passive range um, ends. Okay, full breath in, exhale out, slowly let go. Don't let the ankle drop, turn that hip out. Three, two, one, last time. 
<laughs> this is why I only do for like three reps, like a three rep max. They come into that passive range, give it all you've got, slowly let go of the ankle, don't let it drop. Okay, hold it up there, then we're gonna slowly lower down, control it, five, four, three, two, and one. Woo, boom, hip external rotation. That's just one of numerous ways that we can work on, on getting some strength there, opening up some other ranges of motion. Hmm. All right, so let's, just trying to look here at my, at what else I had covered. Um, let's leave kind of uh, hip rotation stuff, just in the interest of time. Let's move to some, some hip flexion work. Okay, so, um, let's lay down, I'm gonna lay down on your back really quick and let's just come into a standard uh, hamstring stretch here. Okay, so let's keep the left leg long, lift your right leg up and use your hands here to help the stretch. Okay, so again, supported stretch or passive stretch. If you don't wanna keep your left leg long, you could also bend the knee here. Make sure your spine stays neutral so don't pull that right leg in and then lift your butt up and round your back. Okay, looking for pure hip flexion here. So I just want to do a quick round of tails and rails here, and then I want to show you some other end range training stuff um, called hovers that we can do for straight leg hip flexion. Okay. So again, all, a lot of people are all just stretching here. A lot of people are like, oh, my hamstrings are all so tight. Everyone wants to stretch hamstrings. Again, it might be more of an issue of not having the hip flexor strength to own this hip flexion position. Okay. Just different ways of looking at why certain joint positions aren't working for people. Okay, so let's take a full breath in and exhale out, pack the breath down. You start 10 to 20% trying to push the right leg away from you. You can also think about trying to bend the right knee all isometrically. We're trying to get those hamstrings fired up. Also should feel your glute firing up as if you're trying to push the right leg back down to the floor. Go a little bit higher, 20 to 30, 40 to 50, building up. There might be some shaking going on. 60 to 70, give it kind of a max, max safest effort here. Drive that leg away from you. Don't break your arms though. Five, four, three, two, and one. Now use the muscles on the front of the hip, the hip flexors, try to actively pull that right leg closer to your face. You'd even take your hands to your right thigh to give your right leg something to push into. Okay, hip flexors, make them work here. Teach them that they can be strong when they're in this shortened position. Five, four, three, two, one, re-grab the leg and just stretch. Okay. And like David mentioned before, a lot of passive stretching, if you're not making a lot of gains, they're really this active, this, this teaching the nervous system that on both sides of the joint, you can create force, really effective and efficient way of opening up ranges of motion as opposed to just passive stretching. So let's just switch to the left leg real quick. Okay, so find that, that passive range of motion, just keep your spine neutral. All right, here we go. And again, ideally we would be holding these stretches a bit longer. So let's take a full breath in and exhale out, pack the breath low, 10 to 20%, start pushing the left leg away. You can also imagine you're trying to scrape your left heel down, not without actually bending your knee, but just creating that, that tension there in the hamstrings, 30 to 40%, 50 to 60%, hold tight with your arms and hands, 70 to 80. There's some sort of like max safest effort here. <sighs> My leg is like shaking like crazy. Hold there, five, four, three, two, and one. Switch to hip flexors, front of the hip, try to actively pull that left leg in. Take your hands maybe to your left thigh to give your left leg some feedback, something to push into. Five, four, three, two, and one. Hold on to that left leg, just relax. Okay, all right, let's come on up out of that. So let's say that, you know, we had some adequate, you know, hip flexion and we wanted to work on um, something called hovers. So this is another an end range control option that uh, David, you mentioned some end range control stuff. So let's do, let's work on the right hips. So you're gonna bend the left leg in. Hold on to your shin, like hug your shin. And again, if you want to lean against a wall, you lean against a wall. Otherwise, you don't have to have a wall. You're just kind of squeezing into this leg to create some tension. Okay, so already here, we're in about 90 degrees of hip flexion or so-ish, yeah, right? 
Yeah, my back's round. Again. Yeah, if your back's if your back's round, it might be a little bit a little bit different. So you know, try to sit up a little bit as tall as you can. Now we're going to see if we can strength train the hip joint in this position. We're going to see if we can do some lift offs and hovers from here. So remember, if you're close to your end range, you're not expecting to get some huge range of motion here. Even just like a millimeter, a slight lift off is is going to be some powerful training. Okay, so here we go. Take a breath in. Exhale out. So let's like preset some tension. Let's do the take your right hand to your right thigh and start trying to push your leg into your hands. So you feel your hip flexors, your quadriceps, all that stuff firing up. Keep pushing into the right hand, lift the right leg up. Whoa, straight leg hip flexion, brutal. And lightly set down. Okay, again, preset some tension. Again, if you want to use your hand there, a little bit of feedback, lift up. Ah. And set down. If you find this super easy, then you can always. Uh, like pack this you know, a deeper compression angle there. It's going to be harder to lift up. Let's do one more. Lift up. <laughs> and lower back down. So now if we wanted to help get more and more complicated training for the nervous system and hip flexion, we could do something called a hover. You would imagine there's a small object to the outside of your right shin. And you're going to lift up and go over that imaginary object to a little bit of a different range and lower down. And we lift back up, come back to the midline, and set back down. Let's just do one more. I'm just going to give you guys a sample of some of, you know, some of these training techniques. So without scaring your way, set down and lift up. Slowly come back to the midline and set down. Okay, straight leg hip flexion, hard. Okay, so jump switch, switch legs. You want to show like a. Like end range. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. You can get <laughs> mad at David for this one. So, end range rotation. This is another one to, uh, that you could show from here. All right. So, you got to lift that right leg back up and you got to keep it there. And lift up. Imagine there's something the size of a tennis ball and you're tracing that with your right big toe. Again, you're actively controlling at your end range of motion. <laughs> Let's go in reverse. Or like squeeze that leg, make a funny face, last circle, and lower down. Okay, and you might need strong hip flexors. Most people, a lot of people. Okay, let's switch legs. Okay. The good thing is you train, you know, in these end range positions in these, you know, somewhat weird positions, and all of that just feeds back into your movements, whether you're, you know, you're squatting, you're running, you're cycling. Okay, so let's just do a few regular lift offs from here. So again. Squeeze that uh, right leg, create some tension, kind of preload, the left hip flexors and quad, lift up, and set down. And again, if you're, if you're not able to lift off, you can also lean back more to create more of an angle. But what I don't want you to do is think of using your low back. Okay, so try to keep the upper body like a statue. You want all the work here in the hip flexors. Set down. Do it one more time, lift up. Light as a feather, set down. Going to some hovers. Lift up, take the left leg a bit out to the side, control it as it lowers down. So lift up, get as high as you can, come back to the midline and set down. Just one more of these, lift up, transfer out to the left side and set down. Lift up, come back to the middle and reluctantly set down. Okay, rest for a moment here. We'll do a few end range rotations. All right, and let's lift up. Take a few little circles here. Go opposite way. Oh, good, good. And go ahead and lower down, good. Hip flexor strengthening. So should we allow a little time now for, I mean, we could just go yeah. on and on with other different, uh, that's just a little sample of how some rotational training, training some linear training for uh, hip flexion might look. I mean, again, there's there's so many different ways to train this stuff in so many different setups. So yeah. just a little idea of what some of the some of the movements might look like. Yeah, and um, you can think of it, think of it just like your other strength training. So say, for example, when you're learning to squat, you start with an air squat. So no weight involved, then you might move on to an empty bar, so a little bit of weight, and you progress from there. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Um, you you can just use your body weight yeah. to start with these, and then once you get stronger and stronger, you can start adding 
Yeah, and they're like more complex movements. Like sometimes we'll do like movement patterns from one position, you know, coming into another and going around, and that kind of gets a bit fancy. But you have to kind of own the prerequisites to get into these positions first before you just start trying to do them. So we'll do very, very specific training for certain joints, certain movements, range of motion. Yeah. So can anyone send us any questions? I don't know. Do they do? Let's see. <laughs> Shoulder problems. What to avoid if scapular pain? Um, what was the question? Sorry. Uh, Shoulder problems. What to avoid if scapular pain? Do you want to start with that? I mean, again, it's it's without. I would say without assessing and see. I mean, I, I don't want this to just be like, oh, we can't help you uh, with messages there. But it's um, without assessing like what where the pain is when you're when you're moving or. Um, you know, that, that I, I would need more information. I mean, I think I personally would need more information from that to, to be able to answer that effectively. Obviously, avoid any any movements that are causing direct pain. Work on your scapula, uh, sorry, on your shoulder. On your shoulder, any any rotational movement, those capsule cars um, that we talked about, they can do bent elbow, they can be straight elbow. Just kind of assessing at what um, angle of the arm or angle of the shoulder joint itself that your scapula is is painful. Also note if you're doing your scapula cars, like where is that pain? Um, that would just be, I mean, one way to kind of look at self-assessment and then we need more information to, to move on yeah. from there. I had some... I had some tight, uh, some... Tingling. tingling. And your an ankle's going numb in 1990 lift off. Is in this in this one in this position here? The lift off there from there, or the pails and rails. It could be. Um, I mean, it could be just. I mean, the ankle, especially especially if what often people do in the um, the rails contract. I'm not sure exactly what point. Sorry, the pails and rails. Okay, so <laughs> so in the pails contraction. Again, if you're kind of increasing the weight down into the ankle, the ankle is going to get heavy. Just make sure that you're actually, the force is initiating from the hip. Might be one thing. Also, I mean, you're just, you're engaging the ankle. So there might be some, some kind of nerve stuff going on there that can make it start to be numb. In the rails contraction, a lot of people will try to, instead of uh, externally rotating the hip, they'll do kind of more funky things with their ankle, they'll kind of like sickle the ankle in. So I don't know if potentially you could have been doing that and putting more of the, the tension in the ankle joint um, instead of trying to really get most of the work in the hip. I know the ankle will want to do funny stuff, but you gotta really kind of put all of the work into the hip. That's yeah. possibly what could have happened. And um, if you're like new to these movements, yeah, and, like your body isn't accustomed. Your to nervous them. system is probably like, what is going yeah. on? <laughs> uh, and we, we like our pails and rails contractions would go on for a pretty long time. Yeah. Well. So again, a lot of the stuff it can be new. quite intense if you're like, if you're new to it. So like, okay. start off a bit easier maybe, and uh, maybe uh, don't don't easier. don't go as intense or uh, for for as long maybe when you're first mm -hmm. starting. Yeah. Let's see. Is there a comment here? Okay. I'm trying to catch up. Okay. Cool. Any other, was there any other questions that came up on yours? Um, uh, no. Okay, let's see. All right, any other questions here for Zoom folks? Oh, should you still practice these movements with slight injuries? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I would say always avoid pain. Um, yeah. So say, say when you're doing like your cars or something, you can do your cars in a pain-free range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, if you have an injury where you have pain in shoulder flexion uh, or, or like injury in shoulder flexion, you can just do like a smaller circle where you don't feel yeah. that pain. Um, and then same thing if you're doing like a pails and rails contraction, uh, maybe, maybe the tissues can handle like a 20% okay, yeah, effort yeah. pails. Mm -hmm. But if you go start going 30, 40 percent, then it starts hurting. So just keep it to like that low level yeah. contraction. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, again, that's just, well, it depends on the injury, but yes. Yeah, so, I mean, cars, again, just moving around because if you, if you injure a joint, obviously there's some severe cases where you just might need to like stop the joint from moving. But again, if you're over time, if you're going to get the tissue to start healing and laying back so that your, you know, for example, your ankle joint knows it's an ankle joint, you're not going to end up with like a stiff joint. You start having to put some gentle like feedback and pails. Like I, I, uh, had some injury on my inner knee and my ankle when I fell when I was surfing and you know I, I, I didn't do much for a while I started doing some very gentle knee cars and ankle cars and then doing some like like um, David was saying some pails contract I stayed away from rails for a while but some pails contraction just really light 10 to 20 percent in certain positions um, just to start getting some more <laughs> like you know strength back into some of those positions that um, that I was injured in. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's many different theories on, you know, a lot of times I was like, isolate, don't move it. But again, at some point, you're going to have to move the joint or the area that's been injured. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with something that's just all can't move. Yeah, and that movement can tell the body how, like, how to heal itself in yeah. a way. Yeah, how to lay down the right, the right tissue there, yeah. connect the tissue. But definitely um, avoid, avoid, like, that sketchy type of pain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because then you're just going to cause like more inflammation mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah. 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 Cool. Anyone else? I had someone ask if this is going to be available to watch afterwards because like they missed most of it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I, sure. yeah, I'm going to leave mine up, I think, on my Facebook page. Facebook, yeah. So you can go back and watch the whole thing from the start if you want. Yeah. yeah. Good. And thank you guys so much. Oh, let me just read this here. I was just going to end. Okay, if you have a few more minutes here, I was just going to end with some some more spine movements because I think you could never never have enough of a good moving spine. But instead of doing them in a cat cow position, let's come into laying on your back. Okay, so we're just going to end with this. So as if you're going to come and have your have your knees bent, feet about hip width distance apart. And there's a natural space between your low back and the floor, so that's the natural curve there of the lumbar spine. I just want you to flatten that. Okay, so press your low back into the floor. So you're coming into a little bit of, of flexion there in the low back. Okay, and then we're going to start peeling up very slowly. So, so if you know bridge pose in yoga, we're starting to move in that direction, but super, super slow. You begin tucking your butt under, start peeling off, you know, where the sacrum is, start lifting up from there, that real low lumbar area. So you're using those low abs to control the lifting up of each vertebra, vertebra by vertebra up through the low back and let's just stop kind of at the base of the ribs so as you see I'm not lifting up very much I'm just working on lumbar spine and then very slowly push down the lumbar vertebra and so it's just some articulation here in the low back this can be very useful especially if you have limited uh, movement or limited awareness of if your lumbar spine is articulating well because there you have the floor and you can really see is it just like one big chunk that lifts up or can you kind of peel off bit by bit through the low back this is just one great way of if your low back is feeling not so happy just getting a little bit of very uh, concentrated movement there trying to lift up each vertebra at a time there's five vertebra there so one more time, slowly peeling up. And then if you want to go a little bit further, we can start moving up into the thoracic spine. So lifting up a bit more through the mid back. Of course, the shoulder blades and upper back will stay on the mat. Let's take a couple breaths here. And let's do the same thing rolling back down. Okay, so upper back is already there. Start rolling down. You know, have to kind of tuck your tail underneath you, just pushing down each vertebra one at a time. It's just another useful way of starting to get uh, some awareness and control of your segmentation there in the back, as opposed to being in the, the cat-cow position. And let's just, since we're here on our backs, let's just take a few breaths here. Let's take your hands to your side ribs, your side body. You can keep the, the knees up or straighten the legs out in front of you. Take a full expansive breath in. So you can push out into the side ribs. You can think of also expanding into the back body. So like a 360 degree expansion there of the inhalation. And then with your exhalation, exhale all the breath out. It's like you're 
almost like a core sitting effect. And inhale, big expansive breath in. And exhale all that breath out. One more time, expansive breath in. And exhale all the breath out. Take a couple more breaths here. Just relaxing. And of course, if you can stay longer, you can keep laying here if time permits. Otherwise, we should probably call it. Okay. All right. So make your way back up. All right. So again, thanks very much for joining us. Um, that was probably like a lot of information um, there. So you can feel free certainly to uh, message me. I'm sure David feels the same. If there are yeah. any, any questions that you have, either you know, on message us on Facebook or whatever else, Instagram. <laughs> whatever other <laughs> ways you have to get a hold of us. And um, I don't know, do you have any programs coming up that you want to talk about with any mobility training or um, unsure, unsure with the <laughs> virus stuff about what will be open and when and what will be on offer? Um, well, yeah. so, no, so if there's anything the, you want to mention. <laughs> at the moment, um, I, I'm teaching, um, I teach a mobility class Sunday morning at 10 a.m for alchemy in Bermuda. So you can, I think, you can like get like a, a class pass for that and attend that. Is that on their Facebook um, Live? The, no, it's on Facebook, Zoom. Sorry, Zoom. Oh, okay. yeah, it's on Zoom. So Zoom. you know you need to get the, like the login, got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have actually been working with some people remotely mm -hmm. where they've um, sent me some videos of like their cars and mm -hmm. some capsule cars and I've, mm -hmm. I've given them some uh, sort of like a program based on uh, what I think they need yeah. for their particular mm -hmm. sport or what they want to do with their body. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, you can follow my Instagram and YouTube. Um, David Lund Fitness. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for, thanks yeah. for tuning in. Yeah and, I yeah, and I currently have, so I have a, I have a private Facebook group where I'm teaching uh, kin stretch classes three days a week and uh, yoga classes uh, three days a week out of that that goes through May. And I will most likely be continuing with, with that same setup in June. So I mean, whether you're local in Bermuda or I have uh, some students as well that are not in Bermuda because the classes are recorded and posted to that private Facebook group. Um, I, as well as David, I also have private clients that I work with remotely or in person. And I, I, I plan, which I think David, you do as well too, plan to kind of expanding some of the online classes or that we have uh, potentially via our website. So maybe be on the lookout for that. <laughs> I know both yeah. of us have talked about it a lot, whether we actually get our butts in gear and, and create some other um, online um, uh, training stuff. I know I, I definitely would like to do that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah that's that's just... okay. Oh, still okay. Okay, good, good. All right. So that's all I had. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful that you guys took your time to uh, listen to us today. <laughs> hopefully it was helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, hopefully stay safe and we'll hopefully see you in person as well. So. <laughs> in person or yeah, that's right, hopefully. All right, thanks everyone. Feel free to send us any messages or any other feedback that uh, comes up after this session. Okay, so let's start closing.